Welcome to the Medwai News Podcast. Today we are discussing the final results of the Phase 3 GOG 240 trial, which investigated the role of bevacizumab in women with advanced cervical cancer. These results were published in The Lancet a few weeks ago, and we spoke to Dr. Krish Thivari, who is from the University of California Irvine Medical Center and is the lead author of the study. Well, we broke it, we, to, to use a term that's used often in the United States, we've bro- broken the glass ceiling in this <laughs> disease. The trial included 452 women with metastatic, persistent, or recurrent cervical carcinoma. They were randomly assigned to receive chemotherapy, either with or without bevacizumab. The chemotherapy could be cisplatin or topotecan, both given alongside paclitaxel. Overall survival was significantly longer for the group that received bevacizumab, at a median of 16.8 months versus 13.3 months for the group that didn't. This study was conducted in a very, very um, difficult-to-treat population of women. These are women who mainly had previous radiation therapy, uh, usually using platinum, cisplatin as a radiosensitizer, and they've relapsed. Maybe 20% of the study group actually presented with metastatic disease, but this is a very difficult population to treat. Women with recurrent and metastatic cervix cancer previously radiated for the most part, and they were randomized to two different chemotherapy backbones with and without bevacizumab or Avastin. And the primary endpoint was overall survival. And fortunately, we were able to show uh, statistically significant and what we believe to be a clinically meaningful survival advantage amongst the patients receiving Avastin, regardless of which chemotherapy backbone the Avastin was combined with. These results follow on from those of a pre-specified interim analysis, which was published in the New England Journal of Medicine back in 2014. That analysis already showed a significant overall survival benefit with versus without bevacizumab and led to its approval in around 60 countries. But Dr. Tiwari nonetheless stresses the importance of this current final analysis, which was conducted after a maximum follow-up of 50 months or more. Even though at the interim analysis there was a significant improvement in survival, and those results were binding, it resulted in the FDA approving Avastin for cervical cancer. Still, there was some question whether those results would um, hold up with longer follow-up. And with this study that we just published in The Lancet, Mm -hmm. um, which is the final overall survival analysis, the um, results did hold up. Uh, The survival difference is 3.5 months, which is modest, but in these young you know, cervical cancer patients are different than other women with cancer. They tend to be younger. They're in the midst of their careers. They have small children at home. And three and a half months is the median. Um, there were actually many patients who had survival improvements that lasted beyond three and a half months. And that appeared to be meaningful for many patients. Off note, the overall survival benefit was accompanied by improvements in other study endpoints too and it did not come at the cost of the participant's quality of life. The benefit observed um, also translated into a significantly improved progression-free survival Mm -hmm. and a significantly improved response rate. And most importantly, the survival benefit obtained was not accompanied by a significant deterioration in quality of life. And we evaluated the quality of life using three different instruments that had been used in previous studies in these populations to study quality of life and um, survival was not overshadowed by a decrement in quality of life. Quality of life was the same whether they got a bastard or not. The GOG 240 team did identify a previously unreported side effect of bevacizumab, namely fistulas. These were observed in 15% of women who received bevacizumab, but in just 1% of those given chemotherapy alone. But as Dr. Tewari explains, none of the cases led to surgical emergencies, sepsis, or death. Safety profile was very interesting. We identified a new um, side effect of this drug. You know, previous side effects that have been known included bleeding, often presenting as epitaxis, which is, you know, nosebleeds, um, hypertension, uh, blood clots. Those were all known. Um, even bowel perforation was a known complication of use of Avastin, especially in women with ovarian or colorectal cancer. But in our study, all those things were very low in incidence, but um, we did identify fistula as a new side effect, and this occurred in about 15% of patients overall taken Avastin. It was only clinically insignificant in about 6% of the patients. 
But unlike bowel perforation, which occurred in ovarian cancer patients, patients on a basket with cervical cancer, the fistulas, if those who developed them, never led to a surgical emergency, sepsis, or death. Although Dr. Tiwari says that the results are practice changing, and they undoubtedly are, given the number of countries around the world that have approved the drug for this indication, barriers to the uptake of bevacizumab remain. And the main issue is cost. Right. So I think so. bevacizumab is very expensive, and what's interesting is a couple things. Mm-hmm. Even just because the drug gets approved, for example, in India, doesn't mean the patients are going to get it because it's expensive. But what I found is that you know, I've been traveling around the world. Um, I've, I've visited 39 of these countries in the last three years. Mm-hmm. And they're, different countries are trying to do different things. Like, for example, Ecuador has bevacizumab approved for all seven indications that it's approved for in the United States. Mm-hmm. But the government is providing it to patients with colon cancer and cervical cancer only. So even though it's approved for seven indications, the governments in some countries are making a conscious effort to provide it to the poor who have specific diseases. And Ecuador uh, needs to be highlighted for that. I mean, look at the United Kingdom. I mean, before even the U.S. FDA approved it based on our trial, the United Kingdom's Cancer Drug Fund lifted our trial results. And, you know, the Cancer Drug Fund is in the business of approving drugs that are not cost-effective. And they made the decision to approve the drug Mm -hmm. for women with cervical cancer. Some Countries are trying to do innovative things to get the drug to the poor. But more importantly, the patent for bevacizumab is, is expiring um, within the next couple of years, both abroad and in the United States, and biosimilars are right now on the horizon. And provided that the biosimilars are tested appropriately and you know mm-hmm. are e- efficacious without intolerable side effects, I think biosimilars may be one way to bring the price down. We're at the end of the life cycle of Avastin. Dr. Tiwari points out that trials of bevacizumab biosimilars are already ongoing in Asia, while in the USA, companies are starting to develop such biosimilars. All of this hopefully means that in the near future, the drug will no longer be out of reach for women in low-income countries and communities, women who arguably have the greatest need for the drug. These findings also have implications for the later-line treatment of women with advanced cervical cancer, as Dr. Tiwari explains. I think the take-home message is that the Benef- the survival benefit is sustained. Um, it's mm-hmm. not a short-lived thing that we saw as an interim analysis. It was sustained with longer follow-up. And what it tells us is that angiogenesis is an important target for in cervical cancer. And so moving forward, I think immunotherapy and combinations of immunotherapy with other anti-angiogenesis strategies are going to be important. And so I think that, you know, we have not, we in, in the United States, through the NCI, we've conducted now nine phase three randomized clinical trials over three decades mm-hmm. in this population. And finally, for the first time, we've got our foot in the door and made some progress. Not a lot of progress, but um, at least for the first time, we don't have a negative study. Now, we the idea is we've identified a potential window of opportunity to which patients responding to Avastin may now be treated with other active agents before they start progressing. So we bought some time without, you know, affecting quality of life. And I think that in the upcoming years, we're going to see several other active strategies to help these women live even longer. On this hopeful note, we'd like to thank Dr. Tiwari for taking the time to speak with us. We hope you have enjoyed listening to this podcast and will tune in for future episodes. In the meantime, do check out our website for more news, more review articles and more opinion pieces covering the breadth of oncology research. 